Hey everyone, it's Kona and Ethan here. We just wanted to stop in real quick before we get started this week and say a big thank you to my brother, Justin. <laughs> he is our latest podcast supporter. Thank you very much. We um, don't advertise this because we don't offer any extra. <laughs> no, we, don't, we don't really have it set up <laughs> yet. Yeah. I mean, we do plan on doing a Patreon down the line when we have like the bandwidth to do extra episodes and bonus content, things like that. Uh, we're just both incredibly busy and cannot do it right now. But thank you so much um, for supporting us anyway. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everybody that's supporting and listening. I know. And leaving reviews. Those are the best. Yes. Thank you, guys. All right. Let's get on with this week's show. If you're a parent, think of how many times you've opened the door to your child's room to check on them as they sleep in their bed. When they're babies, maybe you'd want to make sure they're finally actually asleep. Or you want to make sure that they're still breathing because your new parent anxiety is through the roof. When they're older, maybe you just like seeing them still and quiet and peaceful. But isn't there also a tiny part of your brain that wants you to make sure they're still there? This reptilian fear that something could have happened in the time since you tucked them in and you'll open the door to an empty bed. On September 11th, 2000, that's exactly what happened to Leah Hackett when she went to check on her eight-year-old son, Zach, around 4 a.m. She opened the door and was confronted by a parent's worst nightmare, an empty bed where her child was peacefully sleeping just a short time before. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Zachary Bernhardt. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Zachary Michael Cole Bernhardt was born on December 18, 1991, to Leah Hackett in Lakeland, Florida. While no father was listed on Zachary's birth announcement, Leah, who was 20 at the time, was living with her boyfriend, Jason Hibbard. However, that relationship ended shortly after Zachary's birth, when a paternity test revealed that Hibbard was not Zachary's biological father. Leah moved out of the home that she shared with him and started living a life as a single mom. The story of Zach and Leah's life together is really a story of duality. Leah raised a sweet, smart, empathetic boy whom everyone loved. He excelled in school, and his former teachers and administrators remembered Leah as a caring, involved mother who volunteered at the school and did things like help plan school carnivals. She proudly displayed Zach's artwork around her apartment, and the pair seemed very close. But that's just one side of their life. The other side reveals an unstable environment filled with different boyfriends, partying, trouble keeping a job, and multiple evictions. While Leah was a loving mother, according to her family and those who knew them, she was also unable to create a stable life for her and her son. And that's part of what makes this case so tough and why I wanted to talk about it. Being a single mother is so hard, and I've been there. And especially when you're as young as Leah was. I mean, she was only 20 when Zach was born. Single moms get judged harshly, and every action and decision that they make is picked apart. And that's just in general, like not even if something like this happens. So telling this story is difficult. I want to present the facts as objectively as possible, because this is one of those cases that so lends itself to value judgments, either rightly or wrongly. But with that said, the story of Zachary's disappearance really does start long before that September night when he went missing from his bed. It really started the day he was born because the circumstances of his life are relevant to his ultimate disappearance. Leah Hackett's family, including her mother and sisters, lived in Florida. So while there isn't any public information that I could find about where Leah went after moving out of her boyfriend's home um, with baby Zachary, it would make sense if she stayed nearby and, you know, leaned on her family for support. And there are indications that she did that. 
Bernhardt isn't the name of Zachary's biological father. It's actually the last name of Leah's stepfather. Oh, so do we know who his biological father is? Yeah, so we don't. And that actually does come up a little bit later. Okay. But we do know it was not the boyfriend that she was living with. Correct. Yeah, James Hibbard was not Zachary's father. Um, and really, James Hibbard kind of ke- seems to exit the story, basically. Right about there? Yeah. Okay. Leah's stepfather told the St. Petersburg Times in 2000, shortly after his grandson's disappearance, quote, as far as Zachary was concerned, I more or less was his dad, end quote. But though Leah and Zachary were living in Clearwater, Florida at the time of his disappearance, that's not where they always were. Sometime between 1991, when Zachary was born, and 1994, Leah fell in love again. She moved to Chelsea, Michigan, which is a small town near Ann Arbor. That's a quite a distance. Yeah, it's a huge, huge move. Yeah. Um, But she moved there to be with her boyfriend, Robert Jacques III, um, who was an engineering student at the University of Michigan. While in Michigan, Leah became pregnant. During her pregnancy, she lived with her boyfriend's parents. In 1994, Leah gave birth to a daughter, Liren Veronica Jacques. Now, given the fact that Leah didn't have any sort of relationship with Zach's biological father, I would assume that Zach was with Leah in Michigan um, at this time, but I can't confirm that. According to that article that I mentioned, which was written by Christina Hedrick, Zach's family wouldn't say either way. In any case, Leah didn't end up staying in Michigan for long. Her relationship with Jacques deteriorated, and she ended up suing him for custody of their daughter. In 1996, a judge granted her permission to take the little girl and move back to Florida. That's kind of mind-boggling. I mean, it makes you wonder what the state of Jacques' home life was. I mean, grant grant custody to the mom, fine, but giving her permission to move back to Florida from Michigan. Well, I guess because her whole family was there, maybe there's more of a support system. And maybe if Zach wasn't with her in Michigan, there was the extra thing of her needing to move back to be close to her other child. Yeah. I don't know. In July of that year, Robert came down to visit his daughter. And this is 1996. This visit is really interesting to me. Presumably, the relationship between the exes was still pretty contentious, and they met up on a stretch of I-75 to do the drop-off. Like on a highway? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I mean, I I guess they probably went to a rest stop at least, or like a restaurant or something, but it still seems very strange to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm a child of divorce. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember my parents doing the exchange at, like, McDonald's. Oh, really? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe... That's just where it was convenient. Um, But this is the interesting part. Leah didn't just bring Liren. She also brought Zachary, who was four at the time. She wanted Robert to take both children so she could go out. Okay. Reserving judgment. Yeah. Well, I know. And that's the thing. I don't know if this was a prearranged plan that Mm -hmm. the two had Or if Leah just showed up with both kids and Robert decided to take them or like what was going on here. Because again, and it's so hard to say because we don't know for sure if Zachary was in Michigan. Because it very well could be that if Zach was living with them in Michigan that... Maybe Robert had a relationship with Yeah, and he wanted to see him, you know? And he wanted to take both kids and spend time with them. So it's, yeah, it's just so hard to say at this point what's going on. It's also unclear how long Robert was supposed to have the children, but at some point he started paging Leah, trying to reach her, but she wouldn't call him back. And keep in mind, 1996, so there weren't really cell phones at this point. So paging (laughs) was still like (laughs) more connected than, you know, a lot of people were at that point. By the next day, which was a Sunday, Robert had enlisted Billy Joe Jimenez, Leah's older sister, to help find her. But she was similarly unsuccessful. By Sunday night, they called the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office and reported Leah missing. 
So, yeah, I don't know what the original plan was, but, I mean, it clearly wasn't, wasn't for him wasn't to have. Weekend. Exactly. Right. Yeah, because if they're reporting her missing by Sunday night, yeah. then, yeah, that's crazy. Things have escalated quickly. Right. Leah showed back up on Monday, but Robert was done. He took Liren back to Michigan with him, and a judge ruled that she could stay up there with him. So Zach, he stayed in Florida? Yeah. So I have to imagine that this wasn't like an isolated incident, you know? Yep. Because I feel like if it's one thing, a judge isn't going to just say, oh, yeah, you're right. Like, Leah can't have custody anymore. Yeah. So this was a rough time for Leah. She's still in her early 20s and is clearly going through some things. So she loses her daughter, who was not yet two, and it was around this time that Zachary actually ended up going to live with Leah's sister, Billy Joe. Leah moved to Ybor City, which is near Tampa, into an apartment with her new boyfriend, 22-year-old Matt Geddes. That relationship didn't last long, and it did not end well. In November of 1996, the pair had split, but apparently a few days later, Geddes found Leah at another man's apartment. And you may be thinking, like, what's the big deal? They broke up. Um, but they were still living together. Oh. So breakup or not, you know, those situations tend not to be very happy. Later that night, back at the apartment, the pair got into a fight. And according to police reports, he shoved Leah. So she called 911 and Geddes ended up being charged with misdemeanor domestic battery. Leah continued to spiral after this. She ended up being the one who stayed at that Ebor City apartment while Zachary still stayed with his aunt. But in May of 1997, Billy Joe couldn't find Leah again. After finding out that her sister also hadn't been to work in two weeks. Wow. Yeah. She grew incredibly concerned, yeah. as you can imagine, especially after Leah's employers told Billy Joe that the reason Leah hadn't been in was because she told them that her mother had died. But their mother was fine. Billy Joe filed a missing persons report and told police that she was concerned for her sister's safety because she, quote, liked to drink and had expressed suicidal thoughts in the past. Do we know, is there any history of drug use? No, no. Going, disappearing like that for... Days at a time? Yeah, that that's usually indicative of some sort of drug binge. Uh, you know, I can't, I mean... Hardcore alcoholics, of course, will, mm -hmm. you know, go on benders for, for days, but they also don't typically disappear. Yeah, you know? and I don't know. So n drugs never come up in anything that I've read, um, but alcohol does frequently. So, I mean, I think there probably was an issue with alcohol mm -hmm. um, of some degree, but yeah, like nobody ever specifically said anything about drugs. Thankfully, though, Billy Joe was able to get in touch with Leah a few days later. As 1997 turned into 1998, Leah appeared to be trying to get her life back on track. She moved out of the Ebor City apartment, and she and Zachary moved into the Lucerne Apartments in downtown St. Petersburg. Even though she had her son back, she still wasn't leading a super stable life. Leah became the apartment manager at the Lucerne in July of 1998, but this job wasn't exactly above board. It's a very Florida kind of job because um, she didn't receive a salary for this position, but instead was a paid in the way of free rent and utilities. So she had those expenses taken care of, but like didn't actually have an income right. coming in. Yeah. So how's she paying for food? Right. I don't know. Yeah. You know? But this, even this arrangement, you know, didn't last long. It only lasted for a few months. One of the complex's owners, Richard Martinez Jr., fired Leah. And we don't know why she was fired, but the firing apparently led to a dispute, which ended up turning physical. According to court documents, Leah claimed that, quote, Martinez ripped off her shirt while trying to wrest the complex's keys away from her, end quote. The judge ordered Martinez to avoid contact with Leah, and she and Zachary moved yet again. And this is interesting because in other articles about this, um, there's mention of an altercation with a man that Zachary witnessed. And I think this is actually what that refers to. And, you know, I think that 
that gets brought up because, um, you know, as maybe a possible suspect in whatever happened to Zachary. But honestly, this, I don't think that the two are related at all. Like, this seems like a very isolated incident that happened several years before Zachary disappeared. And the judge ordered him to stay away from her. And by all accounts, he did. Yeah. How old is Zach- Zachary at this point? So this is 1998. So he's, you know, he's about seven, seven. six, seven since Leah didn't actually have an income at that point, she couldn't afford to get another apartment. So she and Zachary moved in with a friend of hers. But that also didn't last long, as apparently Leah didn't pay her either. And it's unclear, you know, like what Leah was doing for a job at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, But reading between the lines, it sounds like the friend tried to kick Leah out, but Leah just kind of refused to go. Squatter's rights. Yeah, and so the sheriff's office ended up getting involved in this as well, and the friend just ended up moving out. Mm. So, yeah, she decided she wasn't going to deal with it anymore, and she just split. So Leah asked the building manager if she could then just rent that apartment. But what's interesting about this is that Leah wasn't just using her situation as a down-on-her-luck single mother to tug at the building owner's heartstrings. She also told him that she had cancer. The landlord, An Yak Win, told reporter Christina Hedrick, quote, I felt sorry for her. She had no husband. She has a kid. Her son goes to the YMCA down the street. She says that's good for him. She says she has cancer, woman cancer, end quote. So, okay, this would, of course, be awful because, I mean, it's not like she needs one more thing to deal with at this point. But Leah's older sister, Denise Simpkins, had no knowledge of this being true at all. But it wasn't the first time that Leah had made the claim. Remember how I said that Leah was involved in Zachary's school and Mm -hmm. had a really good reputation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So Zach's teacher, LaRue Pearson, knew Leah because she was so involved. And she said that Leah also had told her that she was dying of cancer. This whole cancer thing really is an interesting detail and does appear to be completely false. And I can understand why she would tell that to the landlord just to kind of, you know, bolster her case and trying to get an apartment after her roommate tried to kick her out. Mm -hmm. But I'm really not clear on why she would say that to Zachary's teacher. Sympathy. um, I mean, I guess, but like to what end, you know? Well, she's clearly got some, some psychological issues going on beyond the pathological liar standpoint. Um, but the, that's the weird thing. It doesn't sound like she's necessarily lying about a ton of different things in her life. You know, this is like the one big example that I could find. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what the point would be lying to the, the, the teacher about it. Yeah. And and this doesn't seem to come up later either. So this isn't like, a, you know, an ongoing thing, you know, because from what I could tell, these are the two people that she told this to, and she didn't continue it after that. Hmm. Cancer or no cancer, Leah continued to not pay rent. So in April of 1999, she was evicted. This is how Zachary and Leah ended up in the Savannah Trace Apartments in Clearwater, which is where they were living when he disappeared. In reading about Zachary and Leah in the years leading up to his disappearance, I keep being struck by the duality in Leah's personality, which I mentioned at the top of the episode. I mean, here we have this young mother who honestly does seem like a bit of a mess. She's bouncing around. She has another baby, loses custody of her, leaves her son with her sister so she can move in with her boyfriend and apparently lies about having cancer for some reason. But on the other hand, Everyone in Zachary's life says that he and his mother were very close. And after they moved to the Savannah Trace Apartments, Zach attended Eisenhower Elementary School. And that's where Leah got involved and helped plan the carnival. So it's like this whole thing about her being this involved, caring, loving mother that continued, you know, from school to school. Mm -hmm. So she can't be written off as some neglectful party mom, but nor can she really be framed as the loving, stable mother of a son who was the victim of a freak crime. And that's, I think, why so many people have a a hard time with this story. Um, 
because you just really can't put her in either camp completely. Right, and and the the one side, the party Mm -hmm. aspect, makes you wonder if that had something to do with the kidnapping. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, the fact that she was so caring and so loving really is, you know, makes you kind of go the other way. Right, to think it was just a random kidnapping. So let's get to the days leading up to Zach's disappearance. Leah and Zach were well-known around the apartment complex. Leah had become friends with one of her neighbors, Deanna Williams, who had a daughter close to Zachary's age. The two mothers would take turns babysitting each other's kids. The friendship eventually became strained, though, because Leah didn't have a phone, and so she basically started using Deanna as an answering service. Deanna eventually got tired of taking messages for Leah, and so the babysitting arrangement and the friendship pretty much ended. A week prior to Zachary's disappearance, Leah was notified that she was being evicted yet again. But that same night that she was told that, Leah was spotted out in Ybor City at a bar called the Green Iguana. And remember, Leah used to live in Ybor City with her ex-boyfriend when Zach was living with her sister. Right. And the ex-boyfriend actually said that he was there that night as well and not saw with Leah. Her. No, not with her. Just he, I think that was just like one of their hangouts yeah. when they lived there. And I bring this up, though, because if you're not familiar with Clearwater, like, you know, I know you're not, but I I practically grew up there. Um, My grandmother lived there my whole life, and uh, my dad lived there on and off, too. So I spent, like, big chunks of my childhood in Clearwater. Ybor City is not close. Like, no. no. And Clearwater is a beach town. Like, it's actually a huge spring break place. So there are no shortage of bars. Like, bars on every corner, tiki bars, like, everything, right? Um, But Ybor City is, like, a half hour away closer to downtown Tampa. Mm. So, going out there drinking, I don't know. It just, it seems a little out of the way. Well, I mean, it's like you said, though. This was, this was probably a former hangout of hers. Right, exactly. So, maybe she has more friends there. Yeah. Than Clearwater. Very true. And that probably is it, you know, but she also has her ex-boyfriend who's like on probation (laughs) based on this altercation that they had, who obviously also hangs out there. And where's Zachary at this point? So that's actually a sticky situation. And, you know, I said at the top of the episode that I want to stick to facts. I don't really want to get into rumors too much, but there is one that I think could be relevant Like I mentioned, Deanna Williams was kind of done with Leah at this point, so she wasn't babysitting for Zach anymore. Leah did have family around, though, you know, like in the general area. I don't know exactly how close to Clearwater. Um, So it's very possible that one of them was watching her son or, you know, that she just hired another babysitter. Mm -hmm. But there have been rumors that Leah would leave Zach home alone and go out after he was asleep. That's terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if this was the case or in general, or if this was the case on, you know, on this particular evening when she's out in Ebor City. Exactly. We don't know. It is is a rumor. rumor. But it's not an unheard of thing to happen. And so... I, it does come up again, and so I did, you know, just kind of want to mention it. The day before his disappearance, on Sunday, September 10th, 2000, Deanna said that she saw Zach playing outside by himself. And this apparently wasn't an odd occurrence. But he asked where she was going, and when she told him she was going to a barbecue, he asked if he could come with her. But she didn't take him, and that was the last time that she saw him. The story of what happened in the early morning hours of September 11th, 2000 has changed over the years. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Leah's story has changed. It could simply mean that what investigators told reporters evolved over the years. But I'm going to start with the basic story that was reported on the day after Zachary went missing. According to an article in the St. Petersburg Times from September 12th, 2000, Zachary went to bed as usual on Sunday, September 10th. Leah, at the time, was working nights as a telemarketer, so her internal clock was just all messed up. 
So she stayed awake after she put Zach to bed. She told police that at 4 a.m. on September 11th, she took a short walk around the apartment complex. She returned at 4.15, just 15 minutes later, and Zachary was gone. She looked around the house for Zach and then started calling around to the neighbors, including Deanna Williams, you know, to see if maybe Zach had woken up and gone over there, Mm -hmm. you know, when he didn't see his mom at home. No one had seen the boy, and at 4.45, she called 911 and told them that her son was missing. In that 911 call, she says she left the door unlocked. The article mentions that one of her neighbors said they saw Leah's car pulling into the apartment around 3 a.m., but detectives said that Leah denied this. After police were called, they jumped right into action. They searched the entire complex. They went into vacant units, interviewed neighbors, ex-friends, like everyone. They even called his school to see if anyone had seen him. A K-9 unit was brought in that day to try to track Zach's scent, but by 4 p.m., nearly 12 hours after he was reported missing, no trace of the eight-year-old was found. So the front door is open. Front door is unlocked. Unlocked, yeah. So there's no sign of forced entry. This exactly. Isn't, this isn't a case where somebody slashed the, the screen. No. Nope. And he's nine at this point? He's eight. He's eight? Mm-hmm. So he's, he's almost nine. Eight, almost nine. So, I mean, with no sign of struggle in the apartment, at least not that yeah, no, nothing reported. Mm-mm. I mean, that to me right away says that it's somebody he's familiar with and he left willingly. Yeah. Or Leah says that Zach was an incredibly heavy sleeper. So her theory was that basically he just somebody got just scooped up. Came in and scooped mm-hmm. him up. I mean, you'd have to be a really heavy sleeper to sleep through that. Yeah. Because usually, you know, like we pick up our sleeping kids all the time and usually they kind of like wake up a little bit. and They at least stir and open their eyes. Right. And I think if they were to see a stranger, yeah, then, you know, it might they might not just go back to sleep and, and go willingly. Also, it would be <laughs> a random kidnapper's best case scenario for him to just... Yeah. Happen to see this woman, you know, leave her apartment at 4 a.m. Unlocked Mm -hmm. at 4 a.m. And then just go in and there's a kid there. You know what I mean? This some this is somebody that Zachary and uh, um, Leah and Leah know. Yeah. And so the, the short window is definitely something that people have been having problems with, you know, 15 minutes. In the middle of the night. Somebody is, had to have been waiting there. Is shocking. Watching. Well, and that's actually what Leah thinks. So Leah thinks that somebody had been watching her, you know, for some period of time. And like, so they knew when she left mm-hmm. and didn't need a long time. They could use that short window to just go in and get Zach because that's something that that person had been planning. Right. And if it's somebody Zach knows... It would be a quick in and out. Right. Wake him up. Hey, Zach. Well, because that's the other thing, too. I mean, so this, I it, it's an apartment, but it's a two-level apartment. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to know the layout. And from what I'm understanding, too, Zach wasn't sleeping in his room. He had actually fallen asleep in Leah's bed. Which is on the second floor? I assume so, yeah. So this is somebody that is possibly even familiar with the apartment, then. Right. But, I mean, yeah, I don't know. The search continued for Zach, who police immediately classified as an endangered missing child. Um, You know, they didn't think he ran away or anything. He didn't have a working bicycle at the time. None of his clothes were missing. You know, like I said, there's also no sign of a struggle. I mean, police really didn't know what had happened at that point, but they knew that it wasn't good. Just covering our bases as far Mm -hmm. as the the runaway theory, like, no eight- or nine-year-old is going to, like spring out of bed at four in the morning when his mom randomly goes on a walk right to go to run away like that's that's something that you know they pack a backpack and you know dramatically leave like after a fight or like when they're grounded or or something yeah if if that's if that's the case or if it if it is something that they plan Mm -hmm. you know they're leaving after dinner they're leaving when they on their way to school you know they're not they're not storming out of the house at four in the morning. Right, exactly. And I mean, luckily, it doesn't 
seem as though the cops, you know, wasted any time Good. on this or yeah. anything like that. But it is just something that one of the detectives mentioned when he was on the news, you know? Yeah. By the third day, when they still had no clues, they brought out cadaver dogs to search the nearby woods. They also brought out helicopters and boats to search for the boy. In the preceding days, Leah had stayed sequestered in her apartment with her mother and two of her sisters. On September 13th, she emerged to read a statement to the press thanking investigators for searching for Zach and pleading with him to come home. I actually have the full statement here. Do you want to read it? Quote, first thing is, my family and I would like to thank everyone who has searched, helped, passed out flyers, prayed, or thought about Zach since he disappeared Monday. The media has been very helpful and respectful through this whole ordeal. He is a beautiful boy inside as well as out. He himself would be the first one out searching if he could. Anytime Zach heard about anyone in trouble or needing help, he asked how he could help. Anyone who ever met Zach loved Zach. The support of the community has shown us how much Zach is loved. We miss him. We love him very much, and we want him to come home. We're all here waiting, so please don't stop looking for Zach and help bring Zach home. Thank you very much. Leah didn't answer any questions from reporters afterward and went back inside to her apartment. Earlier that day, though, Leah's mother and sisters reportedly sat on the curb outside for hours just showing reporters photos of Zach and Leah um, you know, but they didn't talk about his disappearance because obviously they don't want to say too much. Right. Yeah. But that is smart of them to, to get the pictures out. Well, exactly. And they, you know, it really seems like Leah's family worked very hard from day one to get as much publicity as possible for this case and to get Zach's face in front of as many people as humanly possible. Um, you know, so during that afternoon when they were talking to reporters and everything, they also went and taped up flyers and you know, showed reporters notes of encouragement that had been sent to the family. Um, like, they spent a lot of time out there because they wanted reporters to be there. They wanted them to take an interest. That's important to to relay here. I mean, that's, that's not that we ever want there to be a handbook on what to do when your child goes missing, but law enforcement are, are behind the eight ball when they get called mm-hmm. to, to things like this. So really how they're going to find a missing child if they don't turn up having gone left on their own accord is through the public, through help. Yeah, through exactly. Through somebody seeing them. Right. So, yeah, get as much air time as you possibly can with the local media. Mm-hmm. Since this was day three, police were understandably getting less optimistic for Zachary's safe return home. Likewise, they were absolutely baffled by what could have even happened. Clearwater Police spokesman Wayne Scheller told reporters, quote, Nothing has panned out. What has mystified us is that there is no evidence of anything. No evidence of a crime, a runaway, nothing. We don't know why he is gone. End quote. By September 18th, police had searched over a thousand acres in Clearwater. They also impounded Leah's car, you know, just as a matter of course, um, but didn't say whether or not they had found any evidence of anything in there. Leah's mother and sister stayed active in the search, visiting the Clearwater Police Department just to check in and get updates on the search. They were also planning on driving out to other cities to hang flyers in hopes of keeping Zachary's face out there. What about um, interviews? Have they interviewed exes? Yeah, so I don't know that they've interviewed exes, but, you know, the first question, because, all right, when you look at missing persons cases, especially missing children, Um, one, like 99% of everyone who's reported missing is found quickly. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when it's a missing child, it's a custodial kidnapping, right? Like it's, it's usually a family member. And so of course they're like, Hey, what's the deal with Zachary's dad? Now I mentioned that, you know, he wasn't in Zachary's life. Well, it turns out that. Leah had never even told him that he had a son. So she finally told police who the guy was. um, And police, of course, did interview him. And he was like, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Haven't seen Leah or spoken to her in years. Did not know about Zachary. So the Um, police were the ones that told him that he has a son and, and his son is missing? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if maybe Leah called him like to give him a heads up or something. But yeah, basically... 
you know, so he was quickly quickly ruled out, not just because of that, but because he also was nowhere near Florida mm-hmm. at the time. Okay. But I also assume that um, police talked to the exes because, like, Matt Geddes, that one who lived in Ybor City, mm-hmm. he was giving interviews to newspapers. So, you know, I can't imagine that he would just he, randomly he involve himself. The cops never talked to him, right. you know? Yeah. At this time, one week into the investigation, Leah's reported story remains the same. Zachary was in bed. She took a walk at 4 a.m. and left the door unlocked. She returned at 4.15 and he was gone. But the next article I could find was the one I referenced before that did such an excellent job of digging into Leah's background. It was from September 28th, and in it, Leah's neighbor and former friend, Deanna Williams, was interviewed. And this is where we get the next version of the story. All right, remember how Leah called Deanna after she realized Zach was gone? Yes. Okay. According to Deanna, Leah didn't tell her that she had been out for a walk. She said that she had gone for a swim in the complex's pool. At four in the morning? Exactly. So that also seemed weird to Deanna. And Deanna said, quote, I was like, you can't go for a swim because the pool was closed at 10 o'clock. Right. Now, this does make it look like Leah changed her story, but I do think this is more of a case of reporters going on what police told them, not necessarily what Leah told police. Because at this time, which is September 28th of 2000, Leah's 911 call had not been released. Reporters had, of course, asked for it, mm-hmm. but police didn't want to release it because, you know, the investigation was so new and they just wanted to keep it kind of close to the vest. But part of the call is featured in the disappeared episode about Zachary. And Leah does tell the 911 dispatcher that she went to the pool, came back to shower, and her son was gone. And that's and she's still claiming this is only a 15 minute window. See, and that's the thing that bothers me about it because... Yeah, this 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes keeps on coming by. But, like, if you watch the whole Disappeared episode, it's her family who's interviewed. It's, like, her mom and her sister, and they really make it sound like it is longer than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because at one point, she also says that she took her garbage out and drove it over to the dumpster and, like, and walked and went swimming and came back. So maybe that lends some credence to the neighbor saying that she saw her car moving around at three in the morning. Right. And that's so. exactly what I was thinking too. And so maybe it's a possibility that all of these things happen, but maybe not all at once, right? Like maybe she did go take the garbage out at three o'clock, mm-hmm. came back, and then later went out, for you know, walk. for the walk and maybe came back or maybe went to the pool. But, you know, so so maybe all these things did happen, but they weren't all at the same time. And maybe it still was a 15-minute period in which she was gone and Zachary could have been taken because she had come back before and seen him. Mm-hmm. Like, all of this gets a little fuzzy. And I think that's why, again, Leah comes across as kind of shady because... First, it's 15 minutes. First, it's a walk. Then it's a pool. But again, like I said, she said pool from the very beginning, literally from the 911 call. Right. Um, so at some point, it was misconstrued that she went out for a 15-minute yeah, like walk. Yeah, like something. Yeah, exactly. Something was misconstrued somewhere. But going swimming at 4 a.m. is incredibly weird. Right. But you also said that she works nights. Right. And assuming this is a... a quote unquote day off for her so Mm -hmm. like you have to think about this as being almost like it's four in the afternoon for her exactly normal person right right but still very weird to go swimming (sighs) at four in the morning when your son is asleep yeah and it's not even just that um the whole swimming thing seems to have been pretty spur of the moment, you know, because, all right, you live in Florida, you've grown up in Florida, you have a hundred bathing suits, like that's just your life. Um, but Leah decided to go swimming while wearing all of her clothes and without a towel. Hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people think that's pretty weird. Yeah. I mean, you know, assume, I'm assuming she was probably just wearing like shorts and a tank top or something like that. Something that's like, you know, I don't think she was wearing an evening gown or like (laughs) a three piece suit or something that would be insane to go swimming in. 
but it is still very weird and to go without a towel and just like decide to jump in the pool and she said later she's like yeah i have no idea why i did that but people armchair detectives have had their own theories okay. about why somebody would do that all right let's hear some well so there is the camp that believes that leah did something to zachary mm. and she made up this swimming story you know to cover it up and that she went into the pool in her clothes to destroy evidence and Sorry. that she came back to the apartment and took a shower to further destroy evidence from her body okay but other than the fact that she did go swimming there's literally nothing else to back that up right we 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 have law enforcement that searched extensively around mm -hmm. the apartment and all the other parts of Florida, too. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you know, this is not a criminal mastermind that can magically hide a body. Right, exactly. Despite continued efforts from Clearwater Police with assistance from the FBI, no clues about Zachary's whereabouts were uncovered. Leah went into hiding and didn't speak publicly about her son after the statement she made just two days after his disappearance. While Zachary's family didn't give up hope, over the next year, his case faded from public view. Then, in the summer of 2001, it looked like this case was going to be blown wide open. On June 22, 2001, a man named Kevin Jalbert was arrested after he told an undercover police officer that, quote, he had kidnapped and murdered boys in the past and gotten away with it, end quote. Jalbert had come onto the police radar several weeks prior to this because he was apparently talking about how he was planning on kidnapping a young boy. So an undercover officer befriended him and the pair went driving around. Jalbert told the officer that he would use bleach to wash DNA off of his victims, and there was a bottle of bleach and a funnel in his car. Jalbert even went to the Savannah Trace apartments and said that he had taken a boy from there. But he apparently pointed at the wrong apartment and got other details wrong, including what Zach was wearing that night. Police arrested Jalbert on the solicitation to commit murder charge, but when they searched his apartment, they also found a bunch of child porn on his computer. Mm -hmm. Jalbert was eventually convicted of several charges and remains in prison. Despite his, quote, confession, police could find no evidence to link Jalbert to Zachary's case. Even his sister said that he was a pathological liar. So while Jalbert was in the area and could be responsible, it's really just hard to tie him to this because there's no independent evidence whatsoever. I mean, he claimed that he kidnapped and raped a thousand boys and killed five. And where are their bodies? Well, exactly. And this guy is dumb enough that he's going to befriend an um, undercover cop and like Spill reveal, right? Yeah. And so, like, we're supposed to believe that this guy's smart enough to rape and kidnap a thousand boys and get mm -hmm. away with it? Right. Like, and kill five of them and right. get away with it. I mean, it sounds to me like he, he was, as his sister said, a pathological liar. Yeah. And he was boasting or bragging to impress his new friend. Mm -hmm. And he probably had some knowledge or remembered something uh, well, it was that a he huge saw case. in the news yeah. right, about a boy being abducted from that apartment building exactly so. yeah and so it's it's awful because it seems so right on right like yeah. it's you know like what are the odds that this guy is gonna come and say oh yeah i kidnapped this kid from this apartment but yeah he also just sounds like a nut job but just a few months later the investigation would go in a terrifying new direction in a strange coincidence, on September 10th, 2001, the one-year anniversary of Zach's disappearance, an article was published on the DenverChannel.com, and that's Denver's ABC affiliate website, so I'm assuming this also aired, you know, on TV. But a few weeks previously, on August 12th, someone found a photo in the parking lot of Gart's Sporting Goods Store in Dillon, Colorado. The photo was of a blonde boy who looked to be around eight or nine years old, lying on the ground with his wrists bound with duct tape. And I'll show you the picture. Like, it's 
It's terrifying. Okay, so this is the picture, the picture that was found in the parking lot. Jesus. Can you describe it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the blonde boy's laying on his back, uh, wrists tied together with duct tape. Um, and the photo's kind of taken at a weird angle. So he's lying on the ground, but the photo's taken, like, in front of him, so you really just see the top of his head. head. Yeah. He looks like he's wearing a weird outfit, too. Yeah, it's like this weird two-tone red t-shirt. Yeah. Is he wearing, like, red shorts also? I think. Red pants? I don't know. Yeah, it is a weird angle. Show me his his picture again. Yeah, I don't think that was him. Right? Like, to me... The nose and the the jaw, like so the the picture of the boy who's bound looks like he has a very angular face, and Zach had more of a rounded, kind of squarish, wider, fuller face. Right, and the the boy who was bound, his his nose was uh, longer and pointier than than mm. Zach's is, even from that angle. Yeah. Versus head on, you can tell it's a different nose. Yeah. But um, still awful well yeah and terrifying and so the photo went national because like so it was found on august 12th and police obviously tried to figure out who was in this picture and find out more information about it and when they couldn't that's when they you know sent it to the news station so that they could publicize it it went national because it's terrifying yeah and that's when zachary's family saw it so they thought okay i mean maybe right like you have to you have to at least consider it exactly so they called the police and the clearwater police contacted the police in colorado you know and said hey this photo might be related to our missing boy here now the photos show pine needles that aren't indigenous to the area of florida where zachary disappeared and you know the haircut is different but again like those are all things i mean i'm sure it's likely that he was moved and you know this we don't know when the picture was taken hair can grow And you said the picture was found in Colorado. In Colorado, exactly. Um, You know, police investigated. They enhanced the photo as much as possible to look for clues. Um, But ultimately, you know, they also didn't think it was probably Zachary. Mm -hmm. And the boy has never to this day been identified. That's terrifying. Yeah. And then the really sad thing about this now is so this is September 10th. You know, the one year anniversary when this picture comes out. And so this family who has had no news gets at least a glimmer of hope that maybe there's something going on in this case. And the grandmother, you know, was planning on having like a press conference and a big, um, you know, just basically really trying to do a second push for the one year anniversary. Mm -hmm. But... The one year anniversary was September 11th, 2001. Right. So once the World Trade Center attacks happen, obviously that's all anybody was talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, and so any anniversary coverage kind of got pushed by the wayside, as you can understand. Yeah. But the next year, in 2002, another boy was abducted from the Savannah Trace Apartments. Mm. This boy, who was five, was playing with friends outside, and he was lured into a van or a truck with ice cream symbols on it. Like, literally, a guy came out of this van and said, hey, kid, do you want some ice cream? Wow. Yeah. Um, so the boy went, the van took off with him, but the child was soon found alive after being left in a dumpster behind a restaurant about 65 miles northeast of Clearwater. What time of day was did the kidnapping occur? Broad daylight, like middle of the afternoon. Yeah, so different MOs on, on, on the two different crimes. Exactly. You know, different ages of the boys. Yeah, like you said, different MOs. The boy was quickly found alive. Mm-hmm. Um, it Honestly, unfortunately, just sounds like a horrifying coincidence. Yeah. Over the years, a lot of suspicion has landed on Leah. I mean, you know, according to the episode, it disappeared. Like, 
that 4 a.m. dip, like I said, was without a bathing suit, without a towel. Um, You know, there's the whole thing about her driving her garbage to the dumpster. And that dumpster detail, I haven't found in any of the articles. Like, I've only seen that coming from her family on that episode. So I don't know. I don't know what that's about or when that was, if that does explain that 3 a.m. sighting right. or not. Yeah. And again, even if, let's say that that happened at 3 a.m., police getting on scene so quickly, they definitely searched the dumpsters. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure that if there was any evidence in there, they would have found it. Yeah, and they brought dogs, right. you know, the next day and everything. Um, but what's also interesting is Deanna, the neighbor, said that when she got home, because she was at that barbecue, remember, that Zachary had asked to come to, yeah. she got home super late um, and was saying goodbye to her boyfriend at 345 and said that she didn't see uh, Leah's car at all mm-hmm. at 345. But Deanna also told reporters that Leah called her looking for Zachary at 5.15 a.m., but the 911 call was at 4.45 a.m. So, like, you know, I don't know how reliable her times are on things. Right. But most of all, the suspicion on Leah seems to be due to the fact that she left soon after Zach's disappearance and would not talk publicly about her son. Leah moved to North Carolina, got married to a man named Michael Cochran, and changed her name to Leah Cochran. They got divorced, and she remarried a man named Hanson, and she changed her name yet again to Leah Hanson. And this is all in the first two years that Zachary was gone. Leah and her husband later moved to Hawaii, where she apparently lives to this day. Now, a lot of people looked at her scans when she stopped communicating publicly, and at first, it really did seem as though she had never spoken to reporters about her son after September 2000. Um, And like I said, you know, that episode disappeared, which was 2017, I think. She was not interviewed. She was not a part of that at all. Um, But in 2002, I did find an article in which she was interviewed by Chris Tisch with the Tampa Bay Times as she joined a walk for Missing Children's Day. She said that she moved to escape the constant recognition and scrutiny, and that after she moved, she hit rock bottom and contemplated suicide. Quote, my family wanted to protect me, she said. I was going through so much. I was a basket case. I couldn't function. When Zach disappeared, I lost myself. I don't know who I am without Zach. End quote. Leah wore two silver rings that Zach gave her that she said she never takes off. She was also wearing a beaded necklace that he made for her. But that is the last time I could ever find that Leah spoke to the press about her son. In the years since, Leah has been quiet about Zachary's disappearance, but her family, who still lives in Florida, continues to actively work to keep Zach's story alive. And like I said, they participated in that disappeared episode. Despite police saying that she is not a suspect, Zach's disappearance and Leah's subsequent behavior has driven a wedge in the family with some members no longer speaking to to others. I don't necessarily think her, her behavior is indicative of her doing something i I, you know you've said it before like it's it's hard to put yourself into that situation right everybody reacts differently to different things and you know not everybody's going to be comfortable going out and talking to the press yeah and bringing up this horrible painful thing over and over and over again and if there are members of the family that have said you know, we'll handle it. You deal with your own issues, your own Mm -hmm. own stuff. Then I don't think that that's suspicious. I I think that that's just how she was processing it. Right. And if you look at it from, you know, from that perspective, like she said in that article that she was waiting tables, you know, shortly after Zachary disappeared and people would recognize her. People would try to talk to her about it. People would accuse her of killing him. Right. You know, I'm sure that the press probably cast some suspicion on her as well. Right. And so, you know, it makes sense to me if you're looking at it from that perspective, like I said, that, you know, she did want to move away, that she wanted to change her name, that she wanted to just try to have some semblance of a normal life. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that she's involved with Zach's disappearance. Yeah. And she clearly, from the article that you just read, she's clearly, you know, still heartbroken over it. Right. And and that's what it seems like. And, you know, cynical people will say, oh, like, that's just another performance or whatever. But you just don't know. And that's right. my whole point. I mean, people make up these their minds over what they see in, you know, a 10 minute news clip or or what they read in one article or whatever. And it's just it's so hard because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Right. You don't know what the people are going through. Right. And you and you pass judgment based on what you think you would do. Right. Exactly. Right. And it's so hard not to, though. Right. I mean, it's so hard to not say like, oh, well, I would never do that. And I would be out there every single day and I wouldn't care what people are saying about me. And I would do everything in my power to stay there. But I, but and maybe you would, it. but yeah, you're not living it. And, you know, she clearly had a lot of trouble, a lot of problems leading up to this. It wasn't a good life. You know, she had talked about suicide before. Right. right. Like she might have had to get out of there. Just to stay alive. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the question ultimately, because we don't have any evidence either way. Is Leah Hackett Hansen, a mother who knows what happened to her son and has since started a new life to escape her guilt and forget about him? Or is she simply a flawed woman who didn't perform her grief in the way that the public expected her to? And that's not a question that either of us can answer. No. But as of September 11th, 2020, Zachary Bernhardt, a bright, sweet, loving boy, has been missing for 20 years, and his family is no closer to finding answers than they were two decades ago. Zachary Michael Cole Bernhardt has been missing since September 11th, 2000. He would be 28 years old today. If you have any information about what may have happened to him, please contact the Clearwater Police Department at 727-562-4242 or email tips at myclearwater.com. Tips may also be submitted to Crime Stoppers by calling 1-800-873-TIPS. You can see all of the sources for this episode, along with photos and videos on our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social. And then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. We'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!